What do you think about the tower? It's your first visit to you, so what do you think about the tower? I thought it was a, a really good tower. It was very interesting to go up it. Um, it gave you a really good sense of how busy Cairo is, so I really enjoyed it. That was terrific. It was really great to get uh, kind of a sense of the scale of the city. It's kind of difficult to do that when you're walking around uh, down on the street. It's a breathtaking view, and it really gives you a terrific perspective of the whole city. And I, I loved it up there. I spent a couple of hours up on the tower. Due to evacuations around the Suez Canal, millions travel to Cairo in search of housing. In response to this migration, many building capacity limits for popular attractions were inflated. The Cairo Tower, one of the tallest buildings in Egypt, had its own recommended capacity limit increased from 700 persons to 1,000. 
on the evening of April 16, 2021, upwards of 1,200 visitors toured the Cairo Tower at once. Although concerns of overcrowding had been raised by several staff members, the building manager dismissed their comments. Since the Suez Canal Crab would be passing by later in the evening, he also encouraged visitors to enter the upper levels of the tower, as that would provide a better vantage point. At 8 p.m., the Suez Canal Crab was observed to have turned toward the Cairo Tower and proceeded to approach. Despite an alert sent out by the Egyptian government for civilians to immediately vacate structures in the Crab's path, most visitors ignored the warning and stayed on the upper levels of the Cairo Tower as it came near. At 8.15 p.m., the Suez Canal Crab was seen to have stumbled and in an attempt to regain its balance, crashed into one side of the Cairo Tower, killing over 200 people. The resulting tremors that traversed the building damaged its staircases and elevator systems beyond repair. The cascade of shipping containers from the Ever Given, knocked forward by the momentum of the initial stumble, lasted for over two minutes, as an estimated 800 containers broke from their locks and pushed forward an additional 1,000 containers. As all 1,800 containers tumbled down through the building, the structural integrity of the Cairo Tower rapidly diminished. Falling debris and containers are reported to have killed over 800 visitors. At 8.19 p.m., the Cairo Tower fully collapsed, dragging the immobilized Suez Canal crab into the ground. In total, only 39 of the 1,189 visitors of the Cairo Tower survived. Two of the 15 staff members escaped to safety, including the building manager. None of the six security guards survived. Although paramedics and police officers had arrived shortly before the Cairo Tower's collapse, the visibly unstable tower prompted them to collect survivors on the ground and retreat to a safe distance. At 8.41 p.m., a hazardous waste collection team and soldiers of the Egyptian ground forces arrived to contain survivors within mobile quarantine chambers. Due to fears of a potential contagion contracted from the Suez Canal crab, all civilians in the vicinity were placed in quarantine under the authority of Egypt's military in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. Upon impact with the ground, the Suez Canal crab and the Ever Given separated the large wounds caused by the separation discharged thousands of gallons of seawater and bodily fluids. The hazardous waste collection team and soldiers attempted to plug the gushing lesions. However, survivors report that their efforts were mostly futile due to the team's inability to stay standing on the slippery ground. With the number of accidental falls among the troops on the increasingly wet ground, the Egyptian army diverted its focus from closing wounds on the Suez Canal crab to evacuation efforts. By midnight, the civilian population within a three-mile radius of the fallen Cairo Tower had been completely evacuated. On the morning of April 17th, Egyptian authorities publicly announced that the Suez Canal crab had fallen in Cairo and laid in a vegetative state. Although the Cairo exclusion zone was primarily intended to prevent any media coverage of the crab and the surrounding destruction, several journalists managed to record footage of the site through the assistance of private helicopter pilots. By 8 a.m., clips of the crab were trending on Twitter. Members of the Anti-Device Association attributed the severity of the disaster to the development of intelligent devices, specifically Twitter machines. They reasoned that due to the popularity of Twitter in America, the Ever Given was overstocked with tea machines, which weighed the ship down and consequently caused the initial obstruction of the Suez Canal. On Twitter, the ADA released a vicious string of messages criticizing Twitter, Hillary Clinton, and Egypt. Along with images of the Suez Canal crab, photos of scattered goods that had fallen out of the shipping containers became a popular topic of discussion. One image of a sports car resting on top of debris would be retweeted by the ADA with the caption, The Cairo Exclusion Zone is a conspiracy to keep goods in Egypt. The American people have been robbed. The tweet was shared by over 10 million users. Taking notice, the ADA followed up with tweets suggesting that an Egyptian soldier had driven home the sports car in the image and that the goods needed to be rescued by their rightful owners. 
The ADA deemed April 19th as Finders Keepers Day and urged all Americans to travel to Egypt to obtain the goods left by the fallen Suez Canal crab. Overnight, an estimated 12,000 flights to Cairo were booked by American citizens. Although a few trespassers had been apprehended in the Cairo exclusion zone, officials did not foresee any further disruptions at the site. Medical personnel attended to survivors in the quarantine chambers. Soldiers cleared rubble and attempted to control the spread of the Suez Canal crab's bodily fluids. By 5 a.m. on April 19th, approximately 20 million gallons had been contained through aerial drops of sawdust and an extensive effort to mop the premises. Although several officials discussed a plan to lay down military-grade mats to enable the hazardous material collection team to walk up to the crab for closer analysis, it was ultimately decided that no further action would be taken until the following evening, as it was believed that the midday sun would evaporate most of the fluid. At 12 p.m., over 12,000 Americans gathered in front of the gated entrance of the Cairo exclusion zone. 4,000 Egyptian police officers and soldiers stood behind the perimeter to guard the exclusion zone from trespassers. At 12.03 p.m., violence erupted when an American shot a police officer in the face. Consequently, tear gas was used on the raging mob. Tanks and heat rays arrived shortly afterwards to deter any trespassers. However, by 12.10 p.m., the front entrance gates of the Cairo exclusion zone collapsed from the force of the charging crowd. Informed of the approaching Americans, medical personnel and survivors at the epicenter began to vacate the premises. By 12.43 p.m., the first Americans were seen by officials at the epicenter. Although the wet ground was expected to significantly slow their approach, several citizens had arrived earlier than anticipated since they had utilized car hubcaps to slide quickly across the ground. With no law enforcement at the scene, the American citizens began to collect fallen goods and pry open shipping containers. Popular goods included furniture, firearms, processed food, tea machines, bars of gold, automobiles, and designer clothing. As Americans continued to arrive at the epicenter, more injuries from accidental falls were observed. Concussions and broken arms were the most common injuries during the initial break-in. At 1 p.m., several fights broke out over a Ford pickup truck that had rolled out from a container and crushed a family. Three aggressors were shot by a man who had found a rifle. The conflict fueled an unpleasant atmosphere. With more instances of gun violence as time went on, one notable incident saw the discovery of a container of firearms by a group of young children. The accidental firing of an automatic weapon by one child prompted the intervention of their parents and other adults. The resulting verbal argument escalated quickly and broke out into a full-scale gunfight with over 14 armed subjects, including the children. Another fight erupted after the discovery of a deluxe barbecue grill which 13 Americans had simultaneously called dibs on when the item was pulled out of a shipping container. All 13 Americans died from gun-related wounds. When the last wave of the 12,000 Americans had entered the epicenter, overcrowding ensured that the accidental fall of one individual would trigger a continuous series of additional falls. Without any open space for the midday sunlight to reach the wet ground, the bodily fluid had no time to evaporate and the number of falls steadily increased. At around 1.30 p.m., one of the posterior legs of the Suez Canal crab twitched and incited panic in a nearby crowd. As Americans attempted to flee, many fell on the slippery ground and were trampled by those rushing behind them. By 1.33 p.m., the screams of the panicked crowd had reached a deafening volume, reportedly being heard over five miles away. Due to the reinforcement of the Cairo Exclusion Zone's gates and orders from the Ministry of Health to prevent any American citizen from leaving the Exclusion Zone, the massive crowds were kept inside the three-mile radius of the epicenter, held in place by an orderly line of tanks that flanked the entirety of the zone's perimeter. The gates stood for over six hours as Americans ran from the epicenter. Many soldiers became ill at the sight of injuries caused by the thousands of bodies being crushed into the metal bars. By 7.15 p.m., everyone within a half mile of the gate had perished from extreme pressure. Heat exhaustion, accidental falls, and gun violence were also major causes of death. The Cairo Exclusion Zone gates were opened at 8 p.m. 
soldiers searched for the remaining survivors. Of the over 12,000 Americans who had arrived, only 944 survived. 77 of the American survivors were found kneeling around the Suez Canal crab and claimed to have been promised from a deity that they would survive if they prayed to the crab. However, none of them could account for the remains of dead worshippers that littered the ground around them. They would later establish the Church of the Ever Given during their stay at a local hospital. Howard Melrose, an American journalist permitted to visit the Cairo Exclusion Zone the day after the stampede, said of the site, It looked like something from a medieval painting. All of their bodies were jammed into each other. Everyone became one.